Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks, Powdered Milk here, and welcome to more fan fiction blind commentary. And we're back with Fallout Equestria. And where we left off, in the story is that Pip was explaining Pip Bucks and how they worked. And also he told the story, uh, he told what happened in the, um, in the vault. And... He was tricked by his idol, I guess, um, into removing her pick buck so she can escape the vault, which was kind of big. And in an attempt to bring her back, little Pip will bring her back to the vault. But apparently they won't take her back according to what they say. Also, guys, if you notice that I changed it up from last time, all these little little pip scenes here you can see on the screen I have um, um, we got the three to we got the uh, S um, SFM um, little pip right here just looking back you know about to escape the vault then you have right here we got um, we got little pip doing the little uh, and then in the corner also in the uh, in the corner you can actually um, Sorry, I'm looking at a different perspective. It's reversed, so I have to do this. And you can see little Pip getting all gooey-eyed at... I can't remember how you what her name was. But we'll remember now. So we're actually going on to the next part right when he leaves the vault. So here we go. Nothingness. My first several seconds out... Sorry. ...were a heart-bursting eternity of hoof-pounding terror. The story had been right. All that was outside was a great black nothingness. It surrounded me, suffocating. If I had been able to draw breath, I would have screamed. And then my eyes started to adjust to the darkness. I began to calm, gasping, feeling weak, and now just a little foolish. In my defense, I'd never experienced night before. Hmm. Not really. Sure, I'd always turned off the lights before curling into bed, but that darkness was small, confined to my little room. And there was always the glow from under the door. The hall lights of Stable 2 were eternal. This was different. A cool air, quiet unlike anything within the stable, tickled my coat and chilled my skin beneath. It bore smells that were dank and rotting, dusty and alien. I could hear by the sounds of the night insects, creaking of wood and far-off sloshing. But I was struck more by what I couldn't hear. The constant low hum of the stable's generators and the ever-present high whine of the lights were gone. So powerful in their absence that I first mistook the outside as silent. I could feel the dirt and broken stone beneath my hooves, so unlike the smooth and sterile floors I had trotted all my life. And though I could not see much or far, I could see further than I had ever seen before. There were no walls to mark the end of the room. I was staring into a horizontal abyss that stretched out in every direction in front of me. An entirely new panic began to form within me. My hind legs went out from under me, and I sat up, stunned. I turned my gaze to the ground, breathing deeply, thanking it not only for holding me up, but being a visual endpoint. Then I made the mistake of looking up into the sky, and the absolute endless upness of it sent my head spinning, and my stomach lurching. Great masses of clouds rolled over most of the sky, but there were gaps through which soft light poured, and through those I could see that up went on forever. Insanely, I thought of the clouds as a great net, made to catch me if I fell from the earth into the yawning gulf above. But if I slipped through the holes, I would just... Okay, I'd like to stop here for a sec. I like how he's describing what it's like to see the outside for the first time. And this is so well detailed because I like how well this is written because this is actually putting it into a good perspective. Because what person has that has the luxury to see sky for the first time as an adult? Like, when you're a kid, you don't think much of it. But when you're an adult, but if you're an adult, but you've been locked away for so long, most likely you'll get this if you've been caged for a long time, I guess. Like those who have been kidnapped for a long time, I guess you would get this feeling. But this is that exact feeling, except he hasn't kidnapped. He was just been in the vault all his life. Or she. I don't know if it's a he or she yet. So, but 
it's really big. It's it's actually a a good rep I like how it's well described of what it's like to feel like that each little detail. I don't know if this is written by a male or a female because no, no, and don't take this as a sexist thing, but particularly females write more detailed and more around feeling, and males are just straight to the point, and that's that. And so, if this is, a, it's very rare if a male writes very detailed, but that's just what I've observed. So, just fall up forever. I clenched my eyes shut and tried to keep from vomiting. The fear and queasiness was intense, but passing. My faculties returned. I began to notice those things that escaped me in my initial panic. The surrounding terrain was becoming evident. The world around me did not stretch out evenly. The ground heaved and rolled, hills creeping towards mountains. The earth was punctured by the upthrusting black fingers of long dead trees. Along distant hilltops, I could see the swaying, leaf-shrouded branches of healthier woods. But the living near stable, too, were as few and scattered and sickly. Second, I noticed that my pit buck was flashing with a host of alerts. The map marker was already beginning to do its work on my new and unfamiliar surroundings, and to my surprise, had already pulled a label from the other. Sweet Apple Acres. Turning around to get my bearings, Sweet Apple I Acres. A large ah. of what I had assumed had once been a magnificent house. Now it creaked and swayed in the breeze as if threatening to collapse. Looking at my pit buck again. I noticed that it was picking up several radio transmissions. The radio broadcast from Stable 2 was dark, but new stations had taken its place. My heart leapt for, and it was the first indication that there might be pony life out here after all. I nudged my pit buck to start playing the first station on the list. Still sealed up inside. There is no way out. My son. He ate one of the apples from those damned apple trees up near the stable, and now he's horribly sick. Too sick to move. We fold up in a cistern near the old memorial. We're running out of food and medical supplies. Please, if any pony hears this, help us. Message repeats. Hello? Is any pony out there? Please, we need help. I was bringing my family to the stable up near Sweet Apple Acres, but we were attacked by raiders. Only my son and I survived. We went to the stable, but it's still sealed up. There is no way inside. My son. He ate one of the apples from those damned apple trees up near the stable, and now he's terribly sick. Too sick to move. We've holed up in the cistern near the memorial. We're running out of food and medical supplies. Please, if any pony hears this, help us. Message repeats. Hello. The voice was filled with a terrible resignation, as if the pony had already given up hope and was just going through the motions. Shaken, I turned it off. It didn't... Okay. As I remember from the Fallout games, this is actually something that might would happen, because there are times where you would go out to save somebody. But also, this could be a trap. Because I don't know if my prediction's right, but I have a feeling this is going to be a trap. And I like how I'm actually trying to give predictions. Boz notices when I, me and him watch Supernatural a lot that I try, tend to try to make predictions of what's going on. But that's what I'm trying to do here is try to figure out, is this a trap? Or is he actually going to try to save? Or is he just going to ignore it? Um, or she? In the comments below, if you know whether Little Pip is a he or a she, please let me know. Um, I would just like to know, because um, it, it looks like a female, but I'm not sure. And what I've seen on the internet, it's most likely a female. So, I'm going to start saying she instead of he. But Little Pip sounds like a boy's name, so... Noticed the soft ticking from my pit buck. Checking it over, I discovered that its radiation detector, a feature I had never known to get used to, and self activated. A cute little rainbow dial that had always been planted firmly in the green. It was still there, but edging discreetly towards the yellow. I couldn't just stand here beside what had long, long ago been the door to a simple apple cellar for the rest of my life. Well, I could, but it would be a relatively short and miserable life. Realization was dawning on me. With so many directions to go, what was the likelihood that I would choose the path that Velvet Remedy had followed, even though she'd only had a few hours head start? 
prospect of finding her was bleak. Again, this guy's voice is sexy as hell. And the best chance I had was to get up high and have a look around. The ruins near me rose higher than any of the nearby trees. The sheared off roof of its upper tower probably had the best vantage point I could hope for. I closed my eyes, steadied myself, and went inside. What was left of the Sweet Apple Acres building proved sturdier than it looked or sounded. It was also almost barren. Anything of value that had survived had been looted, leaving only scraps that nobody wanted but the time itself seemed unable to erase. Rusted shoes, boxes of soaps for cleaning dresses that no longer existed, a pitchfork with a shattered handle, a rake. I began up the stairs. My eyes were alerted to a feeble glow, the soft green color of a poisoned apple bathing the room above. The glow came from the screen of an old terminal, a device of arcane signs identical to the ones used throughout Staple 2. It seemed miraculous that this one still worked after centuries on the outside. When StableTech built something, they built it to last. Curiosity lured me in, and my wonder was quickly replaced with understanding. It was no coincidence that this particular terminal was live, for it was on a fresh message. To any pony that had left Stable 2 in search of me, please go home. I am doing what I have to do. The Overmare understands, even if she can never agree, and I hope one day you will too. I will not be back. Do not look for me. Do not endanger yourself further for my sake. Please forgive me. Velvet Remedy. Velvet. I searched the terminal for more, but all other messages were ancient and corrupted, save for one. And that one had a rather unique encryption. Something I had heard of before, but never seen. A binary encryption. Such that in order to decrypt it, I would first have to download the message into my pit buck from both the terminal which had been used to send it. <sighs> Excellent and use of terming. Having nothing better to do no, I don't know if that's a real thing, binary encryption. Was capable of. I downloaded it. In reality, I knew that the chances that I would ever come across the companion terminal, much less that it would be functional, were overwhelmingly against me. Nor did I have any reason to believe a message centuries old would be of any significance. More importantly, I now had to face that outside was my home. Even if I found Velvet Remedy, it was unlikely that she would accompany me back. I'll admit... I had been subtly entertaining a fantasy where the Overmare would be so delighted with Velvet's return that she would embrace us both back into the herd. Maybe even throw me a party. The herd. Join the herd! I was forced to admit how foolish that vision was. Thinking upon this made my head fill with black clouds. But as I reached the top of the ruins and looked out over the wasteland, a bright light, feeble as it was, flickered in the darkness. Just as the light from the campfire not half an hour's trot distant poked. Okay. I'd like to say one more thing here. This is basically the plot, almost like the plot of Fallout 3, because in Fallout 3, your father leaves the vault and attempts to do some, to find a better life, I think. I'm not sure. No, no, it was to, to purify the water, I think. It was to purify the water, and, and you pursued after him. This is basically the same thing. Except little Pip is after Velvet Remedy to bring her back to the vault. And unlike in Fallout 3, it was just your quest, excuse me, to see your father again. So here we go. Poked an orange hole in the night. As I approached the circle of firelight, I knew something was off. Something about the way the dusty beige unicorn was laying on the mat of straw, legs curled up under him. Some tenseness in his body language. But it wasn't until I stepped hoof into the light and got a good look, a warm hello dying on my lips when I saw he was gagged and caught the glint of the flames against a few exposed links in the chain binding his hooves. Well, looky here. Walked up all nice and pleasant, didn't she? A large earth pony emerged from the oh, shadows. Oh, it's a she. It's a she. His hooves clacked metallically against the rocky ground, shot in cruelly spiked pony shoes. Two more ponies slid out of hiding on opposite sides. One another earth pony holding a shovel whose blade had been lethally sharpened. The other unicorn, whose glowing horn levitated towards me, a short instrument of wood and metal with two barrels. Each pony were barding made of thick hide. Much like night, I had never seen a firearm before, save for the pictures in my books. But those books were more than explicit enough for me to recognize the mortal threat. The bound unicorn on the mat shook his head with a sad yet derisive look and began trying to scrape the gag away with his forehoof no longer making effort to keep the chain secret. The three ponies menacing me spared him only the occasional glance. Might as well trust herself up for us, the gun-wielding unicorn snickered, then addressing me. You wouldn't mind, would you? 
laughter. And another unicorn, too. She'll fetch a pretty price, this one. Fetch a price for what? And from whom? The one holding the shovel spear in his mouth mumbled something incomprehensible. Then, apparently deciding the gun was sufficient to turn, spat out his weapon reiterated. I the guy... I mean, look at her. I think she's taking a bath. I was suddenly bizarrely aware of how filthy all four of the ponies were, and how foul they smelled. I managed to cover a gag with a sneeze. What's going on? I asked. With the emotions battling for supremacy in my head, confusion had clawed its way to victory. The captive unicorn finally succeeded in pulling the filthy gag free. They're slavers, you idiot! Monterey Jack, the dirty beige unicorn with the dour expression and a cutie mark that looked like cheese, followed behind me as we trudged alongside our captors. Monterey Jack! <laughs> ...that once was a road. My legs were in chains, making walking difficult, and anything more speedy than a trot impossible. My pit bucket stimmied the slaver's efforts to bind my forelegs, eventually forcing them to chain me above the knees. Had the one with the shovel spear not been holding its point dangerously against my throat, the other two would have gotten a few hoofs to tender places for their efforts. As it was, they made short work of me. I was not gagged, but Monterey had convinced me early that unnecessary chatter from the slaves-to-be would likely result in the loss of my tongue. Not that I had much to say to these brutes anyway, aside from my repertoire of colorful metaphors. I didn't expect they would answer my questions even if my tongue <coughs> should survive the asking, and they were being chatty enough with each other to suffice. Hey, Vifar, grumbled the earth pony through the spear clenched in his teeth. Well then, would you just learn to swim? We could take the long way, couldn't we? suggested the unicorn with poisoned sweetness. Hey, Vifar, by his smell, decidedly more pungent than the others, and I guess he hated water in general. How about you stop complaining and I'll let you sample one of the slaves before we get to the forest? Their leader, the earth pony named Cracker with the spiked shoes, and a cutie mark that looks especially like a whip, or maybe a snake, turned back towards Monterey and I with a filthy smile. I looked away. They laughed. Through the disgusting dialogue, I could hear liquid sound ahead. Not like a burbling water fountain, but closer to a sloughing muck. And... something else. A distant sound getting closer. Music? Yes. Music. Slightly tinny, yet... triumphant? Regal? I couldn't put my hoof on exactly what feeling music was oh, trying to oh, inspire. Oh, 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 oh! It's the radios! It's the little flying bots with the radios. I remember those from Fallout 3. Oh, God. I'm just constantly flying around, the president speaking on the voice sometimes. But it was certainly brightly out of place. Cracker took note of my expression and smirked. You look like you've never heard that before. What, did you live your life in a stable? If you're hoping for the cavalry, that ain't it, Philly. That's just one of those sprite bots. The music cut out with a sharp twang. The unicorn slaver, sawed off, trotted ahead a bit, peering down the path ahead. Turning back to the rest of us, he smirked. Think one of the radigators got it? Cracker suggested it flew into somebody's booby trap. The other earth printer suggested a mouthful of spear-mangled mumbling. The unicorn turned forward again, and the glow from his horn illuminated the machine. A metal ball about the size of a foal's head floating on four silently flapping wings, hovering silently right in front of his face. No arcane science in this, I could tell. It was pure earth pony engineering. Fuck! Sawdoff leapt back a full pony's length in surprise then swung his shotgun to bear and fired at the sprite bot. The sound was like a metal plate falling from the ceiling, and it echoed through the night-darkened hills. Sparks specked the metal ball as it was peppered with scattershot. It leapt out an electric whine and darted into the darkness. The unicorn almost took off after it, but Cracker's voice cut the distance between them. That's enough, sawed off. Save your ammo. Damn it, I hate when they pull that stealthy shit. It's a flying fucking radio. It's not supposed to sneak up on ponies. My ears were burning from the free flow of crude profanity, but I didn't mind. I was mulling over what I had just seen. Idiot, muttered Monterey Jack under his breath. They heard it all the way from Boneyville. Unlike my fellow slave, I was pleased to have witnessed the unicorn firing his weapon, because now I knew how it worked. What kind of a damn fool, Monterey grumbled, announces his presence this close to raider territory. Raiders. 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 Its water slipping and oozing along its banks, half stagnant. The water lapped and sucked at the supports of a bridge, making the wet sounds I had been hearing. 
Beyond the bridge lurked the shattered remains of a pre-war town. The bridge was a maze of barricades. Dark shadows of ponies moved about it. Briefly I may have made the mistake of hoping for rescue, but my eyes were drawn to the spiked poles that lined the bridge and the still rotting heads of decapitated ponies that adorned two of them. I tasted vile. The sight was... horrific. Okay, just stay here. Cracker said, finally putting a name to the spear-wielding slaver pony. It makes sense. Sawed off. Let's go hear what the toll is this time. Monterey Jack lowered his head and looked balefully towards the bridge. I moved closer to him, following his example, and hoping that I positioned myself so Cager couldn't see the faint glow from my horn as I slipped my screwdriver and bobby pin from my stable utility barding. Like all the slaver's equipment, the mandibles on my legs were crude and of low quality. As Cracker and Sawed off argued with the bridge ponies, I focused on picking the first lock was rewarded with a soft click as it sprung open, releasing my pip-buck foreleg. The manacle fell to the ground with a light thump. Huh? Cagey's ears had shot up, and now he moved around to see me. Swiftly, I cut the magic, dropping the screwdriver and bobby pin to the dirt, and hoped that in the darkness the slaver couldn't see the change in my chains. Woof 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 woof. Cagey growled dangerously. The nasty sharp edge of the shovel hovered inches from my eyes. Blam! Cagey turned abruptly, the spear shovel slashing close enough to my face that I shrieked. The gunshot was from the bridge. It didn't sound like sawed-off shotgun, but the second shot did. I took Cagey a breath to recognize that crossing the bridge had become a bloody affair. Glowering back at us, his posture threatening, he started to say... something. I suspected he was warning us to stay put, but I don't know. His head exploded, showering me with gore. I sat there, eyes wide shaking in shock. Blood, warm and sticky, ran down my forehead into my left eye, oozed into my coat and mane. In the growing list of things I had not seen before this night, the death of another pony ranked at the top. I blinked, feeling the blood on my eyelid. Cagey was dead, and I had Cagey all over me. The urge to throw myself into the river was overwhelming, but I wouldn't get to it like this. Pushed for something more than determination now, my horn once again glowed and I began to unlock the rest of my manacles. I spread a glance towards the bridge, seeing Sawed Off hunkering down beside one of the barricades as he magically pulled his shotgun open, stuffing in more ammo. Two shots, I realized. One of the sprite bot and one just now. Two shots and then reload. Closing the weapon, he levitated above the barricade and shot blindly into the violent milieu spraying an already wounded raider pony with a scatter shot. The pony staggered and fell. Unfortunately for Sawed Off, the raider behind him had a different kind of shotgun. One that was faster and not limited to two shots. Hmm, I'm trying to understand this right now. So, Little Pip is trying to escape. She already he picked the locks. And... Oh, sorry. I thought I was going to burp. <coughs> There we go. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, what am I trying to figure out? Um, what I'm trying to figure out here is what is going on here. So far, what I know is that she just witnessed her first death, death like a very brutal death. In fact, I, I don't. I think this is the, the turning point of when you realized. I'm not just that I'm out of the stables, but I'm out in the wastelands. And that's the thing, ing. Because I'm, a, okay, Fallout 3, you're living a normal life, you actually get to grow up in the vaults. And in Vault 101, I believe, yes, it's Vault 101. And. And, uh. There's basically years of living in that vault, and then when you finally get out, you start a new life, and you can never go back to Vault 101. And you have to do things like kill people and stuff like that, and that's what you had to do when you had to escape. You actually had to shoot people in the beginning of the game, before you even left the vault. Little Pip didn't has the luxury to not even experience it yet. Until now. So, let's continue. It fired slugs which tore great holes in the unicorn slaver's body the moment he looked up to see the results of his effort. I turned away, cringing from the nightmare playing out before me. I 
focused on the locks. I had freed myself and was beginning to free Monterey when two raider ponies trotted off the bridge towards us. Stepping over the battle-mutilated corpses of Cracker, Saltoff, and the raiders they had taken down with them. One of those approaching was the unicorn raider wielding a devastating combat shotgun. The other, an earth pony with a sledgehammer, his teeth. The unicorn was laughing. Not the mean laugh of Cracker, but a crazed laugh that sent chills down the back of my neck. Looks like we got ourselves some prizes. The earth pony chortled behind the sledgehammer as the unicorn looked us over appraisingly. The two of them were somehow even filthier than the slavers. The unicorn bore jagged scars across her face and flank, one of them tearing through her cutie mark, several freshly bleeding. The earth pony was hairless and painfully burned over much of her left side. Both were barding that looked ragged and cobbled together. Help us? I suggested weakly. Oh, I'll help myself to you all right. The unicorn reared up and gave me a break, 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 break. hard into my side. Pain exploded and I dropped, gasping. Rearing up again, she brought her full weight down on me. I howled. Near me, Ramonare let out a wet grunt of pain as the earth pony gave him a taste of her sledgehammer. Leaving me crying in a huddle, the unicorn also turned her attention to still chained Monterey. In moments, it became clear they intended to beat and bludgeon him until he was another lifeless corpse and probably not stop then. Hold his leg out. I want to shoot his hooves off. The unicorn raider floated the combat shotgun, a foot from Monterey's blade, left hind leg, the only one I had freed from its manacle. Ignoring the pain, I leapt up, closing the distance and spinning as I gave a fierce back kick. My hooves connected with the shotgun, sending it flying. It clattered onto the bridge beyond. A moment later, I was levitating the shovel spear at the two raider ponies who stood facing me with gleeful expressions. Two against one, and both of them were experienced fighters. The one with the sledgehammer stepped closer, as if eager to see if hammer beats knife. Monroe was on her in an instant, throwing his forelegs over her head, pulling the chain between them across her neck. The sledgehammer fell from her mouth as the raider pony choked. The unicorn turned, surprised by the sudden change in odds could have attacked her then, but threatening a pony is much different than actually attacking one. I wasn't sure I had it in me to slash at another pony, to draw blood, to maim, or possibly kill. The unicorn kicked up the fallen sledgehammer and turned to face me with it, murder in her eyes. Then suddenly, I found it easy to thrust the shovel spear forward. I was no longer struggling with following through on a threat. This was survival. Self-preservation is instinctual. It clears away moral hesitations. Okay, okay, this is very really big, because now Little Pip actually has drawn blood. Little Pip has drawn blood now, and that's that's big. That's when you can't turn back. Yeah. Like, I hope in this story that she becomes a good person. Not, like, a terrible person, because... The thing about Fallout is, it gives you the option of choice. If you play Undertale, you have the the genocide route and the pacifist route, and then there's the neutral route. Fallout has this kind of thing, too, where the ending outcome does become different. Like, I've tried a genocide route once in Fallout 3. It was really dark. I blew up all of, of, of Megaton. All those people died except one. Well, actually, yeah. And she became a ghoul. Well, anyway, let's go. And while I did not have the fighting skills of my opponent, I did have an advantage of my own. Sats. Aided by the targeting spell of my pit buck, I sent the spear slashing across her knees, hobbling her. A second slash, this time across her face, relieved her of her weapon. The third would be a killing blow. Except, I wasn't ready to do that. Not yet. Instead, I swung the spear around, cracking her across the head with its handle hard enough to splinter the wood. The unicorn raider fell at my feet, unconscious. I looked up. Monero was standing, chest heaving over the body of the earth pony raider, the life choked out of her. He was staring at me, quietly. Then finally raised a forehoof only for the chain to clank tight before he had it more than a few inches off the ground. Oh! I dropped the shovel spear. I turned on the light of my pit buck and searched about for my screwdriver. I had lost the bobby pin. 
There was no chance of finding it in the dirt at night. But I had more. Once we were both free, Monterey limped slowly over to the bridge. A moment later, oh, there goes my phone. Turned, his horn glowing in a gentle beige. A sawed-off shotgun followed him. Before I could react, he aimed it at the head of the unconscious unicorn raider and fired. Her blood began to seep across the ground towards my hooves. I watched in stunned silence as he turned and began prodding at the bodies, tugging items from them. Finally, I found my voice. What are you doing? He looked at me as if I was stupid, checking them to see if they have anything valuable on them. With luck, food. I nodded, watching him move to the bodies at the end of the bridge. Looting the bodies of the dead felt wrong, but a cold, rational part of it. Oh yeah, the biggest the problem in the game is health items. Buy. Imagine how embarrassed I'd be if I starved it out here because I'd been too shy to check a dead pony's bag for a pouch of oats or a can of old applesauce. I moved a bit further down the bridge. I looked over the body of a dead raider pony, his face bloody and torn from crack his pony shoes. I started going through the pockets of his body, but my stomach rebelled. I flung myself to the railing, heaving my lunch into the foul river below. The large break in the clouds brought a soft and silvery light to everything. I could see my reflection in the water, still covered by Katie's drying blood. Then I saw a sawed off shotgun hovering in the air behind my head. I'll be taking what you have, too, Monterey Jack informed me with a bored drawl. What? What? I turned slowly to see him standing on the bridge, bathed in moonlight, his horn glowing a soft beige light. The shotgun floated between us, pointed at me. But. but I just saved you! Yeah, and for that I'm not going to kill you. His eyes narrowed. Unless, of course, you do something stupid right now. But I just saved you! Aren't you the top of your class, he said snidely. We should work together. Travel together. Monterey snorted. And split our limited provisions? Go to sleep with one eye open each night, hoping to catch you when you try to stab me in the back? No thanks. My righteous disbelief stopped short of denial. Suddenly, I was so very weary. Nodding, I lowered my head and let my two canteens slip free. I then backed up so he could approach them. I turned my head to start unclasping my saddlebags. I saw it on the bridge just beyond my tail. Turning back to Monterey, my own horn was glowing, and the combat shotgun whipped into the air. For a long moment, we stood there. Two unicorn ponies on a bridge, surrounded by bodies. Shotguns floating between us, aimed at each other. Moonlight shone down on us from the break in the clouds. Monterey Jack broke the silence. You're not going to use that. I saw you spare that raider. If you couldn't kill a pony like that, you don't have any need to kill me now. I narrowed my eyes. I'm a quick study. He huffed, but didn't move. Do you even know how to use that thing? I forced a smile across my face. Do you know that you only have one shot left? And judging by the sprite bot, that gun is in such poor repair, I'll survive being shot with it. Will you survive being shot with this as many times as I can move the trigger while you try to reload? Monterey Jack took a step back, and with that falter, my smile was no longer forced. And I'll be taking my canteens back. Ponyville. I wondered just how my pit buck knew the name of places before I did. He even named the wreckage of a building that I had just slipped into. Ponyville was Raider territory. I just hoped this place... This carousel boutique was not crawling with them. Monterey Jack and I had barely parted ways when the railing of the bridge exploded next to me. A sniper. The same pony, I presumed, who had turned Cagey's head to applesauce. I fled into the town, keeping to what cover there was. A few of the buildings were intact enough to hide in. This was the closest. Fortunately, I was alone. I waited nearly an hour, curled up in a shadow near the door, for the sniper pony seemed uninspired to follow me. No, she or he could just wait until I came out. Fatigue washed over me. I had stayed up all the night before, and this night's events were a strain in both body and spirit. Yep, My definitely. And achy. My body hurt from the kicks I had taken. I felt emotionally played out. I needed sleep. Sleeping here was probably a horrible idea. If I woke up at all, it could be in the hooves of slavers, raiders, or possibly worse. But going back outside to find some place better just was not on the table. I was in no shape to test my wits against the sniper pony again. Carousel Boutique was quite similar in condition to the building up at Sweet Apple Acres, only the looting was more destructive. 
The walls had been painted with crude images of violence and cruder swear words. A pile of torn-up cloth rotted in the corner, smelling foul, like ponies had urinated on it repeatedly. There were two beds, one of which was stained deeply with blood and probably more vile things. The other was a smaller, a foal's bed, nothing but a mattress on a crushed frame. In my state, I felt it would do wonderfully. The carousel boutique offered two more treasures. A locked chest and another terminal identical Wait a minute. Out the acres. The boutique? This one too. You mean fresh. rarity shop? Again to my surprise. It was locked, slipping out my axe. This is Ponyville dark. after all. These terminals were crafted by some of the same ponies who later made the pit bucks. And the encryptions and locks were similar enough that my tools allowed me to get part way through the security. What remained was a puzzle. Finding the password within the strands of code that my access tool laid bare. In my fried mental state, it was probably a small miracle that I was able to parse the code and find the password. Nor, possibly not, the password was Apple. I laughed aloud, catching myself when I heard the volume of my own voice in the stillness of the decrepit bouquet, as I realized that, beyond all realistic chance, this was the computer that the message had been sent to. With an unwarranted feeling of accomplishment, I downloaded it, and let my pit buck do the rest. Age had damaged the recording. But there was enough audible for me to recognize that same female voice, kind of sweet and with an odd accent that had many hours before revealed to me the code that led me out of my old life into this new horrible one. Special instructions for stable two. That's my family down there. Until the poison is gone from up here, that door doesn't open for any pony. The voice faded in and out of static. No, you hate this, sweetie Belle, but you're an overman now. The Overmare are the most important stable in all of Equestria. I need you to do this for me. To keep them safe. Best friends forever, remember? The sound file died down with a whimper. I had been right. There was really no value in a two-century-old message. I left the chest for morning, curled up, and went to sleep. Okay. Hold the phone here, so hold up here. Um, I'm going to click on chapter three, give me a minute here, and, daylight. Okay, 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 um, I think this is all the time I have because I've really exceeded the amount of time I have for this, and it's a pretty long video now, so, um, And what's what's the word? Um, I have a lot to process from this because now she, she is in Ponyville, and she's which is also the wasteland, and she's actually in the boutique that Rarity worked in in the show. Oh man, that's that's really big. That's that me and but judging by what I'm hearing. Something to do with Applejack was done to be the leaders of Equestria because now she was telling I'm judging by how she was speaking she was talking Under her not over Which but yet again that could be mean because there's she's her little sister But she is the over mayor, which is pretty high-end so she must be higher up so what about the other main six? Are they high up too? So I like to find out more. So anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoy this video episode of Fallout Equestria: The Blind Commentary. Um, I really do enjoy this. This is really interesting to hear. And I'm sorry if I'm silent most of the time. It's just I'm trying to listen to the story, and I, I'm I pause it here now so that way I can give you my views and stuff like that and that's what I try to do because then you guys will be able to hear the story as well and you won't understand what I'm talking about if I'm talking over the story so yeah so um, for my next video I'll have like a different setup of pictures on my screen so that way you guys get a uh, uh, wrong way can see some new stuff because I'm going to start changing it up every time so anyway guys I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye!